<laughs> All righty. Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest today is Ben. Uh, ben, um, let me introduce you just a little bit before you introduce yourself. Thank you so much for coming and taking your time. Um, now, I'm going to screen share here, uh, even though it's uh, both YouTube and podcast, but just for the people you see. I've been following you for quite some time. Um, your Twitter handle name is Mr. Cool BP. Um, does it have anything to do with, uh, with the oil industry? or? <laughs> so... And you've got this beautiful site. It's called uh, grassbitcoin.tech. It's a treasure of knowledge, Bitcoin, Austin economics. Uh, so people can check it out. Um, and you have really, really some amazing, profound uh, knowledge that you share, um, you know, about, especially about the question, why Bitcoin? You know, what, what is it good for? What's the purpose? What's the core reasons of all this mess we are in? And yeah, so Ben, Thank you so much for coming again, uh, and uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell me a little, uh, tell us a little bit your your way, your path to Bitcoin. Okay, um, absolutely. Thanks, and thanks again for having me and reaching out. Um, I'm actually relatively new to the space. Uh, I've only been like really into Bitcoin for a little over a year now. Um, I was brought in. It's funny because I I knew about Bitcoin. When it first came out, I was on all the all the nerd sites on the internet. I was one of the first people that was really using the internet as much as humanly possible. I had um, I had a lot of uh, a lot of Palm Pilots, a lot of uh, these PDAs, uh, the the very first, you know, the, the predecessors to the iPhone. And people used to look at me strange and you know, why are you carrying around a computer in your pocket all the day? And they used to call me a nerd. And uh, and it, it was funny. I didn't care because I knew that I was on the forefront of a revolution of information and uh so i i, I heard about bitcoin and I, I read about it but I, I i don't think i really grokked it i don't really understood it um because it i, I just thought it was like anonymous internet money and uh and, and the whole I, I again i didn't get really deep into it but you know the the, the claims they were making about how it could be a revolution um i didn't i you know i was just like ah, that won't work you know um, and then, you know, I, 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 I did see it come up again. And in 2014, I was going to like get some, I was like, you know, Hey, maybe it'll catch on. I think as uh, Satoshi Nakamoto said, it might be worth it to fix them up. And I logged into Mt. Gox and they like asked for my ID and I was like, no, uh, I thought this was anonymous. So close that window and you know, I'd be probably a millionaire now today if I had gone through with that, uh, or, or lost all my money at Mt. Gox. Right. Um, 2017, the price rise is what brought me in, and I, I think that's what really is is really interesting. It's 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 Bitcoin um, proving its its uh, its hardness, right, uh, and its 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 lack of reaction to um, change in demand. Uh, so that's I mean that's what brought me in. Then I went down the rabbit hole. Um, I started like arguing with people on the internet about it and I realized I didn't know enough about the economic side um, and got really deep into Austrian economics and discussing Austrian economics in the context of a Bitcoin world. I mean, listen, they've been talking about Austrian, Austrian economics for a hundred years, but they haven't been discussing Austrian economics in the context, the paradigm of this world that exists now that has Bitcoin in it. Um, you can't turn Bitcoin off. Uh, it's 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 here, right? Um, I, I don't see it going away. You know, people are saying even on like a global nuclear war, we can destroy it. All you need is a few hard drives and a Faraday cage, and uh, it, it's more survivable than many of the systems that we have today. So now let's let's take a look at this world and really let's have a conversation about you know what that means. What are the implications of this technology existing? And you know, as you mentioned, I focus a lot on why. Why are we doing this? You know, why do we care? And uh, it's led me to understand that, like, the world that we have is, I mean, yeah, it's not fair. I mean, the world isn't fair, but, like, this system is super unfair. And it's, it's skewed towards really rich asset owners, and, and it's destroying the wealth of the poorest among us. And, and I think that's really the strike you're seeing around the world today in the first world countries and the third world countries. Uh, and and I, could go, I could go on for hours about this. So I don't, I don't know which direction you want to go with this, but... Uh, understanding this the spectrum you know it's what i uh it's what i talked about on um heavily armed seas podcast the bitcoin echo chamber mm -hmm. is that understanding this technology from a multidisciplinary approach is the only way that you're really going to understand what it is because it, it has weaved itself into everything money 
is everything, you know? It is, is, they call it the root of all evil, but it's, it's it, the source, or it, it's, they say half of every economic transaction, right? It, it is all economic activity is tied into money. And when, when you corrupt money, you corrupt all economics. Uh, so that's, that's really my big thesis. Great introduction. No, that was <laughs> very fascinating. Listen, I mean, we've all, you know, been uh, going this, this, you know, one way or another in the Bitcoin community, people like you and me, you know, pretty much you know, the same paths, you know, with all the, you know, shit coinery, the mantras of blockchain, not Bitcoin, you know, all this stupidity and, and, and indoctrination dogma and, you know, and media stream bullshit. Um, so um, the reason uh, I wanted to talk to you about is because um, this is uh, supposed to be sort of a series of episodes that I want to do. You were the first one actually exactly to this specific topic. And um, now the background is this, otherwise uh, the viewers and listeners are not going to know what we're talking about. The story goes like this. Okay, so we all read, uh, most of us, you know, have read uh, Bitcoin Standard by Safed and Amus uh, with the subtitle, The Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking. And of course, I mean, it's a really brilliant book and I got to really uh, give a lot of kudos and, and, and respect to, to Safed and Amus. You know, if the Nobel Prize, I always say if the Nobel Prize wasn't that smeared with blood and corruption, <laughs> I would say, you know, triple, a triple Nobel Prize for Safed and Amus, but, you know, uh, just, just for the sake of it. But anyway, um, I'm just digressing. The thing is, the background is on... If, you, uh, got, if, if the viewers and listeners, those of you who have read the book, um, you have read uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the pages, maybe you might remember the pages, uh, on pages 96 to 98, uh, there is a specific chapter. It's called, um, it's called, hold on a second, Technological Innovations or something like that, or Zero to One Technological Innovations in the 19th Century versus the One to Many innovations in the 20th century. Basically, uh, essentially most of the publicly available technologies today that we have or have been having in the last whatever century are more or less optimization improvements. That's what Safed and Amus is saying. And Safed and Amus is making really excellent points. And, you know, he cites beautiful studies and works, uh, seminal works, you know, very interesting studies. But there's only one point I have a different knowledge or understanding or perspective or opinion about it. I do say there are indeed highly technological advanced innovations and real implementations, but definitely never disclosed or hardly disclosed to the general public or to humanity. I mean... We don't want to go, you know, I don't want to go now into any kind, you know, of, of woo-woo, you know, down the rabbit hole about, you know, uh, inventors, scientists, engineers that have been whatever disappearing or, you know, silenced or bought off or whatever or murdered even, you know, with two bullets in the head um, or suicidal or whatever. Um, I, I really want to talk about, um, um, my question to you is, uh, Ben, is... Uh, because there's this comparison between the 19th century under the gold standard, hard money, and the 20th century, the easy money, you know, centralized, uh, the central banking fiat controlled, uh, you know, economical system and the whole structure. So this, that's basically the comparison that Safed Amus is making and he's, uh, and he's citing the studies of Jonathan Hübner. You know, there's a study why... Uh, there's a study about uh, with a title somehow with why the declining technologies, the, the number of technologies has been declining in the 20th century. And then there's also Hel Hellman's and Bunches. Uh, the, these authors also had given out a study, uh, you know, uh, uh, comparing sort of the, the eras, the, 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 the different times where, where different technologies have emerged. And, and also citing Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One or whatever, and then, yeah, something like that, zero to one. And so, so uh, my direction of this conversation or of this episode or this series, what, um, what I want uh, is that we go maybe a little bit into depth from your perspective, uh, with your knowledge or with your thoughts and what you know about what, because we're talking about Bitcoin. In the, in the, at the end of the day, we're talking about Bitcoin and Austin economics. So. I've been asking myself, what if 
what if we could explain uh, to people, to humanity, you know, to the people who at least were open-minded and interested, why Bitcoin? What does it do if we, let's just go a lot, you know, you know, into the future, let's say 10, 15 years from now, and everything goes smooth, you know, we're not, we don't only have, you know, the store of value. We got the medium exchange. We have the unit of account. We have everything. We have all the structures. We have a decentralized structure. We have the hardest money that has been ever created in, in the human history. My question to you is, what what do you see? What do you envision would technologically, scientifically, and structurally, uh, and, and you know, and and from processes, from the viewpoint of processes, what would change, and how they how would our civilization transform into? Okay, um, this is a big question. <laughs> um, I think in order to answer that, you have to understand this current paradigm. And I think when you talk to uh, people that are, are not yet into Bitcoin, they point to the last hundred years and they say, look at all the standards of living that have increased and look at how much better, you know, better off we are. You know, we have all these awesome iPhones and, and cars have much better you know, features to them and, you know, our houses have better technology in them and washing machines and all this stuff. And they, and they say, look, it, you know, the system was working great. We have a lot of societal progress, but uh, that, that societal progress is, is not societal progress. It is simply the incredible rate at which technology has been improving. And, and this kind of goes back to what you're saying about, you know, safety means zero to one saying that, you know, inventing electricity in the 1800s is really what has like get this ball rolling to get all these tech. So these exponential technologies like computers, the the prices of computers go down every year. And the reason for that is because we get better at building computers. Um, but we've forgotten that we should see prices declining in across almost every interest, industry as we get better at doing anything, as we inc increase any efficiency, which is the goal of all competition, all economic activity is to get things to be cheaper, economies of scale, these things should sound familiar to you. Yet, we now expect inflationary prices as a rule because um, the Keynesians have literally either lied to us intentionally or out of uh, raw stupidity uh, and following this narrative that inflation is necessary. That you always hear them say this, oh, but it's necessary to keep you know, the economy moving. But they won't be able to back it up when you actually get deep down into these, these uh, arguments because they don't actually understand why. They just say, oh, we have to keep you know, the economy moving, so you have to keep people spending. But that's created this, uh, this society of consumerism that we have now, that we're just constantly spending and spending. Sound familiar? Again. Um, so. Again, let's go back to this. So, so prices should be going down. And, and the reason they should be going down is because we're getting better at making things. And, and what we don't realize is how much wealth is being stolen from all of us. And it's being stolen. And this is really key to understand that it's not being stolen from the wealthy. The, 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 another argument I've heard Keynesians make is that inflation is good because it takes more money away from the wealthy because they have more money. Sounds great, but it's actually the opposite of, of, of the truth. The, the wealthy don't use US dollar money as store of value money. They use asset money. So they're on the asset money train and they're riding the asset wave. It's being inflated by devaluing the money that the poor are forced to hold because they need liquid cash. Um, and the rich can hold a very small percentage in illiquid cash. The rich use this asset money, this volatile, Illiquid asset money, the same way Bitcoiners use Bitcoin itself, because we are looking for long-term store of value. The very problem with our society itself is that we do not have a way to store our value. Even the rich people are like running around trying to find the best, uh, ass the best stocks to be in, the best assets to be in, um, because we don't have a way to store our value. This is actually another integral part of Safedine's book that you're talking about. Um, and you started this off by saying, for those of us who've read it, if you haven't read this, just, just turn this podcast off, stop the video, go read his book, and then come back because you're really not gonna get this stuff until you understand this perspective. Um, the, 
the ability to store your wealth, your, your, your capital stock, as he says, is what has created the, the giant civilizations that we've seen in the past, you know, Rome and, uh, and, and, and the Egyptians and, and the Mayans and the Incans and the Aztecs, all of these civilizations stored their wealth so that they could build very large things. This world that we have now is built on stealing the wealth of the people that hold our money by diluting the supply of money, decreasing the purchasing power of that money to, to either build things or to inflate assets. Um, so what is my point? <laughs> uh, my point is that huge improvements in, in the way that we do things are the, 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 the rewards for those improvements are not being shared among the people, they're only being shared among the people that hold assets. Uh, and that has concentrated the wealth. I have, if you, just, if you just troll through my Twitter account, you can find me posting about all of these, these charts that since 1971, all income gains from productivity have only gone to the wealthy and we've seen stagnation. So while we are seeing technology deflate, the reason we are getting gains from tech, um, you know, the, the best, most in exponential technologies are because they are, they are moving so fast that we're not inflating the money fast enough to uh, make the prices of technology inflate. Uh, and I, 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 like trying to sum up here, um, I, I believe that if we give people a way to store their wealth and, and we have sound money that, it doesn't distort price signals. This is another thing I guess I should get into really quickly is that constantly changing the supply of money um, is, is what uh, creates inefficiencies in the market. It's what denies us the ability to do economic calculations. Uh, so these, these charts are, uh, as you can see, like, like this one just really, really quickly, top 1% of earners since 1971. The, I mean, literally the, the, the date 1971 on these charts just, just, just tells you when we broke from the gold standard, you can see the, the income gains of, of the wealthiest among us skyrocketing and the, the rest of us are just seeing stagnation. Um, this is what is, is preventing societal progress. Yes, we're, we're, we're doing okay. You know, um, uh, the, 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 the middle class are, are surviving, but the poorest among us are doing worse every year. Um, and, and that has created the need for social programs uh, to keep them afloat. And it is, it, it's actually, this is a vicious cycle now because it's, 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 it's the, the worse this gets, the, the more you concentrate wealth at the top, the more you concentrate power at the top, and the more you create the, 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 the poorest among us are like, well, we're not doing so good, but we're the wealthiest, you know, and, and I, I talk from the US perspective and I apologize because I know you're, you know, uh, Kayvon's from, from Austria and, and a lot of people around the world hopefully are watching this, but I, I, I do talk from that perspective that, you know, our country is, is the best country in the world, right? And, and I believe that that is because we've stolen the wealth from all the other countries by convincing them to hold our dollars in reserve in their central banks uh, and inflating their money, the base asset that they use for money, while they also inflate that money on top of our inflation. So we've stolen from all you guys to make our country better. And then you see the poor in America saying, well, if our country is so good, how come we're doing so bad? We need social programs to, to help us out, you know? And, and, and now that's creating more need to print more money. And, and we're seeing, you know, the, the, the social security and the unfunded liabilities or uh, this massive Ponzi scheme that may collapse. We're seeing in, in 2008, the, the bubbles were trying to collapse. And uh, they prevented that from happening by printing even more money. And now they're telling you, oh, there was no inflation uh, for the last decade. Uh, so everything is great. But the inflation has now all gone to these assets, these stocks and real estate, which people are using as store of value. Uh, real estate, I didn't even talk about. You know, Marty Bennett was just talking last week about how uh, there's the like real estate bubble, right? In Manhattan is crazy. I mean, people are just pumping their money into real estate. And, you know, because of regulations, they don't, you know, they don't permit other buildings to grow because, or you know, they don't want to have more buildings because otherwise the, the prices of those assets are going to, you know, fall again. This is it's crazy. It's a crazy devil cycle. But it's not just the bubble. It's like some crazy percentage, like 60 or 70% or something of these houses 
are not being used. (laughs) Nobody is living in them. (laughs) So nobody can afford housing in New York that actually works there because all the rich billionaires are using them to store their wealth. They're using the houses as money because money is that bad. So uh, I know that was a really long rant and I still didn't even answer your question because I'm just... No, it's good. That's, that's, that's important. It's so essential. Why? Yes. So that is why we haven't seen the progress that we should be expecting. Okay. Um, if you want to get into the future, I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I think the exponential growth that you see in technology, we would see in societal progress if we simply had a way to store our wealth. Um, but a really, a really important thing I think has to change. And that is that if you reduce the government's ability um, to print money, then the amount of money that they need to survive, the government, mm-hmm. becomes way more apparent. Um, it, it becomes more obvious because they would have to collect it through taxes. Um, so uh, essentially my argument yeah, is that I mean, they're I'll stealing like, where... they're stealing somewhere around uh, you know, 80 or 90% of our wealth. But we only see, you know, 40 or 50 percent of that in taxes, possibly more. It really depends on your bracket. But if they need 80 or 90 percent of our wealth to survive and they actually start taxing us 80 to 90 percent, well, I think there'd be riots in the streets. Uh, And I think in this way, by removing their ability to inflate their currency, to pay their debts and to fund their wars and to build whatever they deem necessary, I think you take that away from them, you take away the power that they have. I think this is another thing. So even looking back in the Roman times, they were still debasing their currency back then. They would take, they would collect the coins and give you one with less metal content. Uh, it was much harder to do. It took a lot more effort on their part to debase their money. And they, they debased it much slower back then, but it still contributed to the fall of like the Roman empire uh, and many other great civilizations. Now that we can inflate our money so quickly, I had a point, I think I, I kind of locked, locked off of it for a second, but uh, now that we can inflate our money so quickly, we have, oh yeah, so we have the, the, the power of a nation to steal the wealth of all, their, all of their constituents that hold their money is undue power. And it has created these giant nation states that are at war with each other. I think if we take away some of that power, we naturally dissolve some of this power that they have and it makes them smaller. Uh, I'm not one of, you know, I mean, I'm really interested in libertarian philosophy um, and, and kind of, you know, this anarcho capitalist idea, but I'm actually not one that thinks we need to abolish all government tomorrow and just like let everybody be free and transact with each other. I, I do think we less government is, is, is very yeah, necessary. I think it's it. that's, that's the whole point. I mean, it's about freedom, sure. isn't it? It's about liberty and freedom. It's about really uh, making every, all the, these processes uh, transparent. You know, uh, the political structures, we don't need political structures. Who need political structures? I mean, uh, we can, we, uh, that's, you just, you just talked about, you know, like taking away the power. Yes, because the root of this whole power system, this control obsessive power system is the money, is the issuance of money. So that's what Hayek, I guess, meant. The Austrian economist Hayek, when in a presentation, I don't know, in the 70s or 80s, he said, um, you know, we cannot take it violently from the governments, but from with a some kind of his Sly word roundabout. by roundabout, we can sort of get up, get around it, and 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 make it sort of make the issues of the um, of of, of uh, you know issuing money, making it obsolete, taking it away from the government. Then you know that's the root. That's the root cause. That's that's why I always call it the monetary root root layer when I talk about Bitcoin, because you can build everything on that monetary root layer, right? Right. So so now I mean I think we've identified, at least in my perspective, you know this is just I'm just one guy, you know, um, rambling about a bit about Bitcoin here. But in my perspective, I think the root cause, you know, and it, it's it. We're not solving all world problems here, but the root cause of most problems stems from this fact that the governments are stealing the wealth of their constituents and and it gives them undue power. So if we start to take that away, well, what does that look like? Let's actually start trying to answer your question. Um, the One of the mantras you hear in, in Bitcoin is, is individual sovereignty. Well, I think we'll see that. 
we'll see more power to the individuals, okay? So we see oppressive regimes today that exploit and, and essentially their, their constituents are slaves to them. And they, the third world countries are riddled with these. But I mean, I think it's still happening to a lesser degree in the first world countries. Um, we'll see that really it is the individual that gains power here and the government's power is reduced. And that's a great thing. Technology does this. Technology gives power to the individual. Uh, a, a great um, uh, analogy I like to use is, is, is the ability to broadcast, which we are, we are utilizing right now. Uh, this ability was reserved for only people with hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, TV vans with satellite uplinks and very large TV studios, very expensive cameras, now, all of that has been reduced to a little thing that sits in my pocket, and I can broadcast to the world at almost zero, uh, zero effective cost to me, and that has revolutionized information. And this is when I was 12 years old and I was learning about what the internet was. This is in, you know, I'm going to dox my age here, but like uh, 1996, uh, I, it was blowing my mind. I was like, you're going to be able to move any information from anywhere to anywhere at zero cost. And, and people are looking around me like, hey, let's go play outside. And I was like, no, guys, you understand this is going to change the world. And it is, right? The, the, the conversations that we're having on, on Twitter uh, have changed the world. The Arab Spring was, was broadcast to the world because of technologies like Twitter and because of technologies like Worldwide Broadcast. So when you give these, uh, I, I'm answering your question without answering it because the, the, the truth is we, we don't know what the future is going to look like. It's going to explode exponentially. You hear Michael Goldstein talk about this all the time. Uh, I believe, you know, Bent and uh, Matt O'Dell are always talking about this. We, the world is going to explode into, a, I think, unprecedented human progress because economic exchange is at the root of almost all activity in the world. Everything we do is in search of more money. You know, we spend our entire lives trying to get more money and and yet we don't understand really what it is itself we just you know look at the the colored pieces of paper in our pockets with dead people on them and and people are willing to trade for it but understanding what money really is 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 the key to understanding this paradigm that money should be the store of value uh, this medium of exchange and and that is what elicits economic progress and because it is because of our poor money that our progress is being uh, inhibited yeah, and humanity. I mean, he's working to survive. They're working towards money just to survive. I mean, not to mention, you know, all these loans, the credits, the mortgages, you know, the uh, uh, sort of to satisfy the image of, of uh, the expected image of, you know, having a second card and vacation and stuff like that. I mean, you know, people should actually be doing what, they're, what they really passionately want to. And that, you know, brings me back again to my core question, because there's so many genius minds out there. So many, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not a technical person or a technological person, really. I don't have a technological background, but I can imagine there's so many people out there who have really brilliant minds, have developed some kind of ideas, don't know what to do with ideas, if we can bring them together with entrepreneurs, with project managers, with business people, with real investors, with real store of value, which is and will be always then Bitcoin, the hardest money ever created. This is what I'm talking about. So that would mean for me, uh, or that's my question to you, do you would you agree that the that, uh, that the sort of the technological scientific structures, the patent system would, would dramatically change, transform into a totally decentralized system where people like teenagers, you know, people who have really passion and expertise, knowledge about some things, would it be, you know, in the transportation system? I mean, this is the question I've been asking myself. Yes, we have a lot of... Uh, technological developments in a lot of sectors, you know, electronic, communication, stuff like that. But for, for 150 years, approximately, we're burning fuels. We're still burning fuels in what, whatever efficiency, combustion engines, you know, jets, rockets, you know, all these things, but we're still burning fuels. After such a long time, we haven't found a different form of transportation. And isn't that a coincidence that, or isn't, you know, shouldn't that make us like, um, like uh, be really 
baffled that so many thousands of patents have been confiscated in the name of national security within the last half decade in the, alone in the United States. So I, I would push back on your premise a little bit. Uh, I, I don't think it's changing the patent system that's going to uh, help us progress further. I think it is abolishing patents. Yeah. Um, and, and this is not something I've fully explored, so I won't talk a lot about it, but I will just point to uh, an interesting development recently that the one person that is revolutionizing this industry right now, like him or hate him, Elon Musk, has released his designs for his car under open source license. Yeah. It is sharing information that will rise, you know, lift all boats, right? It is, yeah. information wants to be free. And we are keeping it under lock and key. And it is doing that that I think is causing more problems. You know, look at the, it's just as a, a small case study, the, the pharmaceutical industry, okay? I mean, yeah, they'll tell you that, oh, well, it takes 20 years to develop a patent uh, for, you know, for phar pharmaceutical medications. So because of that ROI, or, or because of that investment in capital in order to develop these things, we need to ensure a monopoly on this uh, production process for, you know, another 20 years, just so we can get, you know, just, just so we can survive, right? Uh, no, you are one of the largest uh, cabals in the world. The pharmaceutical industry is insane. You know, Pfizer and all, all these companies. I'm sorry, like you do not need a monopoly on your information. If we were sharing these informations, we were sharing these developments, I think the world would be a better place. And that's not even to talk about the patent trolls and, and all of the inefficiencies introduced by the system doing what it, it is intended to do. Uh, I, I believe abolishing patents is what will bring us to uh, uh, unbelievable progress. Exactly. Sharing these technologies. Yeah. And then letting the free market figure out who can best implement them, right? And, and letting efficiency do what it's supposed to do. Competition is what brings us progress. And at every step in the game, we are stopping competition through regulation, uh, through patents, through distorting price signals in the markets. Uh, and here's a really big one that we didn't even talk about yet is malinvestment. Uh, people, if you don't understand malinvestment, please do a little, do a little looking at this. Uh, essentially, one way to look at this, and this is just one perspective here, it's one part of it, is that the people with access to credit, which are the richest among us have the most credit, um, are the ones with the access to most investment, and they're diluting the supply of money by creating new money in fractional reserve banking to invest in things. And because they have cheap, easy money, 0% uh, interest rates, right? So there's, there's no opportunity cost. Um, the risk to invest has been removed from the situation. And, and that risk is now shifted to a socialized risk on the society at whole. Um, Investment should entail risk, okay? That's what investment is. You put some of your money up and hope that it does well and come back. But when you take the, the opportunity cost measure of an interest rate out of the equation altogether, well, what do you get? You get a bunch of people throwing around money that they didn't have in the first place while devaluing the money of the poorest among us while increasing the asset prices that the rich hold and engaging in what we call a malinvestment. Meaning that because they have all this money, they're just throwing it around, seeing where it sticks, that they're investing in things that don't deserve that investment. You look at all the unicorns uh, and, and the, the zombie, uh, zombie companies. Do you know about the zombie companies, Kayvon? No, it's clean. The idea that these companies are, are so much in debt. Uh, if you look, I don't have this chart handy, but look at um, the percentage of how indebted these companies are. Um, we're at like all time highs. The, the, the U S is full of companies that are, are simply surviving on credit. Uh, Crazy. this is malinvestment. Okay. Yeah. Malinvestment was the housing boom. Malinvestment was the savings and loan crisis in the, in the eighties. Malinvestment was the dot com bubble. Yeah. We're just throwing money at whatever because we don't have store of value. It's, yeah. it's all the same freaking narrative over and over again in all these different ways. So all you have to do is fix the system. And I think the other problems, we can work them out too. I, I don't think Bitcoin will fix everything, but I don't think we can fix everything until we have fixed the underlying broken money. Exactly. 
is at the is at the root of these problems. Bitcoin or, or USD money isn't the problem with everything, but it's at the root of so many of these things. Yeah. That's that's so crucial to understand. And you know, take all the students with the student loans. I mean, who's 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 ever going to pay those back? Why why are these all these people unemployed? You know, why do they have to you know do you know whatever they need to do just to survive? Uh, and this is yeah, it goes back to the chain reaction of malinvestment. Why are people then fired or unemployed or or just not creating jobs? This this system should be you know should be taking care of these people by creating real productive jobs by really right. pro <laughs> and that's we, we are creating jobs but what kind of jobs are we creating what would you call it yeah what would you call that yeah. malinvestment exactly, we're, we're yeah. investing in just jobs for the sake of jobs. the green new deal uh had a provision and, and again that's not a non-binding thing but this green new deal which if you're not familiar with this this revolutionary you know uh thing that's going to save the environment had a provision that said Guaranteed jobs for every American. Uh, I heard somebody talking recently about this idea. Oh, you want to create jobs? Uh, oh, it was, it was Max Hillebrand, who amazing follow follow him right now. Um, Max Hillebrand, he's like, you want me to create jobs for you? Sure. Go shovel dirt from over there, and then when you're done, shovel it back into the hole. I've just created a job. But that's, I mean, that is not a sound investment. We talk about sound money. Well, how about sound investments? Uh, when you expose the opportunity cost to invest in something and you return the risk, you, you, you put the risk back in, then people are only going to invest in things that are really sound investments. Yeah. And especially, you know, what when Safed Anamus talks about low time and high price preference, so that this is how you reduce, you know, you bring in responsibility, accountability, you bring in ethos, ethics, you know, you bring in a real vision to, to what, what, because in the end of the day, what a, why are we here to not only just produce for the sake of producing or creating or serving, but to serve humanity, you know, to, 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 to satisfy the needs, wishes, and desires of the end customers, of the end clients, of the societies <laughs> at large. So, you know, I mean, in essence, what I think what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, my intention, my real, my, 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 my vision is really exponential mass adoption. Even if it means every human being on this planet just holding a handful of Satoshis, subunits of, of Bitcoin. So there is only two ways. Either people understand it because of their existential fear, crisis, panic mode, uh, you know, inflation, hyperinflation, Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, you know, they feel it, they know what it's like. Or we go the other way, like in the Western sort of developed, modern, spoiled, rich countries, like also in Austria, we don't feel it yet. Why should we? Yeah, most people say, I can still my, pay my coffee with, the, you know, with, my, with cash, with credit card, with my fiat money. What do I need Bitcoin for? They're right, yes. They have the luxury of these banking systems, which are gonna be obsolete anyway, but you know, um, my now my question to you is: I mean, I want you to share your thoughts, you know, your perspectives, your knowledge, your vision, on the future of our sort of different different societies and ultimately human civilization on this monetary root layer of Bitcoin, so we can educate, so we can empower, inspire humanity, and help them connect the dots of comprehension. And that, this is about education at the end of the day. You know, it's so, it's, this is so essential, this education, but without zooming out, like, why are we doing this at the end of the day? Why, why Bitcoin? What, what's going to happen? Okay, if we have Bitcoin, let's say we have like the monetary root layer of Bitcoin in 10, 20 years. We got super lightning networks. We got, you know, we, we transact. We got full privacy. We got total decentralization. We we we've done it. We are in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, now the unimaginable, beautiful chain reaction of cause and effect of the soundest, the hardest money ever created in human history, whatever you want to call it. Now, Hans Hermann Hoppe, the Austrian economist, called it the process of civilization, and I call it evolution. It's a process of evolution. It's not changing something. It's not working on the symptoms. It's really t pulling out or making the old roots obsolete and sowing the seeds for these new roots. And so this is what I mean under exponential scientific, technological, maybe even societal, spiritual uh, 
progress, advancements, prosperity, uh, innovations um, by order of magnitude. Right now, we are a collection of nations at war with each other, at constant war. And we're at war with each other because money wars are, are, are a zero sum game. We're all trying to win the money war. We all want our money to do well. And if my money does well, yours does poorly. But we are not a collection of nations. We are a global civilization. We are one people and we have been divided by borders. We've been divided by nation states. We, in the future, will be a collection of sovereign, empowered individuals transacting with each other freely while governments dwindle because we've reduced their power to inflate their own currencies and steal your wealth to empower and enrich themselves. We will see individual humans transacting with each other across borders without government intervention. We'll see freer markets. We'll see people do whatever they want to do. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm, do you want like the day in the life of one of these people or do you, I, the bigger picture I think is more interesting. I, I think the inefficiencies between these currencies, it, th there's this guy, Patrick Dugan, that just uh, Marty Bent just in interviewed. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll understand about 15% of what he says. And the reason you won't understand that is because this guy has spent his entire life getting in between the differences in these currencies and arbitrating them. He spent his life's work trying to reduce these inefficiencies and profiting off the difference. If you take that out and you have one global money, like we had with gold, uh, which evolved naturally over thousands of years, and it was only until we confiscated that gold and, and, and installed these regimes that could steal your wealth, um, we, we will have a global money and a global civilization. I think that's really, really profound. Um, it, we, we have been divided uh, by tribalism, you know? Yeah. The U.S. says, oh, we're number one. Well, guess what? Go listen to any of the other national mottos. It's the same motto. They're all number one, right? Everyone thinks they're the best. But it is, it is humans that are amazing. It is not the US or, or, or Austria or, or Europe that are the best. No, 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 no. It is us as a people. And, and when you meet people and you talk to people, most, the vast, vast majority are good, nice people. Um, I, I think another one that we really need to tackle is education. But uh, that's, that's just such a rabbit hole. I, I think no, it's so, it's, it's the root of this whole thing. The education I, system is so compartmentalized. I mean, I, I talk, the yeah, I talk about alphabet, uh, it's oh. crazy. I mean, this, oh. is, this yeah. is what our educational system has done to the children. Uh, you know, just uh, this whole dogmatic uh, in your indoctrination. I mean, I've gone through the same mainstream school system, you know, like real sort of elite schools and all that shit. But, but what did I really learn? What did we learn? Have we become creative? Have we really found our, our genius of, of, of skills, of talents, of, of comprehension, of or, or questioning the narrative? We never learned that in school. I, I just started, uh, I mean, I 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> I went to public school, but I also went to a school that, that would probably blow your mind. Um, it's called the Sudbury, Sudbury School. There are many of them around the world. Uh, the idea is that kids love learning. And when kids play, they are learning. So simply letting kids play and do whatever they want to, they will learn. So there's this whole school uh, that says you don't have to attend any classes. You don't get any grades. And you graduate by writing a thesis. And your thesis statement must be, I'm ready to graduate and become a member of society. And you defend it in front of your peers. Um, and I, it, this system sounds insane. It sounds like it will not work. It sounds like people will just go play video games all day. And guess what? There's a bunch of them that do play video games. Uh, but there's a bunch of them that uh, you know, play music all day or, or spend all their time in the computer lab. Uh, and and uh, you know, I have a friend that got an amazing job directly out of high school without any college because he spent his time learning about computers. And that's what he wanted to do. Um, 
so my point is not that everyone should go to a summer school. I, I, my point is to change your perspective and turn it on its head that this, this prison system that we've created, that we call the public school system, uh, is not the only way. And that, I mean, my, my, th my thesis about education has, has recently been, we should simply provide you know, staff members in a school and we should teach them critical thinking um, and, and provide a framework for, for learning um, like, you know, math and science and stuff that, that we recommend, you know, and we, we, we show them how to achieve these things, but we let them do what they'd like. And, and we turn them loose on the internet to learn because that's the wealth of knowledge of the world. That is the real revolution that we have seen. It, the Bitcoin is just an evolution of the internet. And, and the internet is just an evolution of electricity that was started in the 1800s. Um, that, that was the zero to one. That, that moving information around is the really profound thing that we have here. And the fact that we have access to the world's information, to, to, uh, that I have access to somebody like you and that you have access to somebody like me, that neither of us are very, very, uh, you know, the smartest person around, but, but it is us together. It is this conversation we have. That is how we learn. You do not learn by me telling you a bunch of stuff. You learn by, by asking me questions and, and me asking you questions. I think you can learn somebody, you can learn something from almost everybody you meet in life. Mm -hmm. And I think having that attitude will really change your perspective because most of us just say, oh, well, that guy's stupid, you know? And, and I think there's, there's still things you can learn from somebody that you just labeled as stupid. It, it is through this conversation that we're gonna have. Uh, it is through our exchange that we're gonna have that we will change the world. One of yep. us, each individually, we will change the world one at a time through, through, for individual actions. Yeah. No, and, it's, it's so important what you're saying, because, you know, this learning process is about, you, you mentioned sharing knowledge and I think it's going to be really a new sort of culture or, or, or mindset and, and ethos that's going to evolve eventually. And the reason why I mentioned this whole patent system is because yes, there are, I'm sure there's so many people out there that, you know, they say, Maybe they say, you know, I don't care about the patent system. I want to share this, but maybe they can't. Maybe they're somehow, you know, restricted or locked up, or you know, or I mean, uh, or, or or somehow from the, by the system not being allowed to share this knowledge because of the patent system. So uh, my uncle has like eighty patents. Oh, seriously? Yeah, they're all through his company, so he doesn't yeah. want any. See, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. So what he's going to do, right? So intellectual property rights are with a company or he's got non-disclosure agreements signed and all this stuff, you know, and this got to change because we have such a vast, you know, treasure of knowledge within, you know, a whole civilization. We've got so much innovative potential. Uh, the, all this technology is going to emerge and evolve. This is eventually, you know, supposed to serve us, you know. It's, it's only serving the guys on top right now. Yeah. The, the constant, listen, like people hear me talk about this, this, this wealth, it, it, wealth gap. I, I think some people will hear this the wrong way because I'm not somebody that's saying we need to go take a bunch of money away from the billionaires. I'm just saying we need to, to change the system and make it fair so that everybody can store them wealth. You know, uh, even if you gave everybody equal money, it, it wouldn't stay that way. It, it would, you know, the, the better people would get more money and, and the people that aren't really contributing to society wouldn't get as much money. Uh, but, but in trying to like save everybody with through these social programs, it's just, you know, in socialism itself, we've destroyed real economic progress. And, and, and the, the, you know, the, the real microcosm of that, the, the, the case studies, Venezuela and the USSR and the countries that are doing more socialism are doing worse. And, and the more that we do here in the U.S., the, the worse it gets. And we don't see that. We're like, oh, we don't have enough of it. Let's do even more. You know, that's what's happening right now. That everyone's calling for modern monetary theory and, and things like the Green, Green New Deal. And just, we haven't been printing enough money. We, we haven't been concentrating enough wealth and enough power. Never forget Lord Acton. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So we should look to mitigate the concentration of power anywhere in our society. You know, there's that, that whole, oh, decentralize everything movement. But we should be decentralizing power itself. Because exactly. when you concentrate power, you, you create asymmetries of power. And, and that's how you ex uh, open the door to subjugation 
and uh, exploitation and, and slavery in whatever form that comes. Exactly. The issuance of money. Yeah. The, you know, decentral, that's, that's what it actually means. The decentralization of power means decentralization of the issuance of the power of, of giving out or dictating money. So for the first time, we don't need even to trust anything, right? We, we, it's trusting the trustlessness network consensus, right? It's about, and all the features that we can dream of about a perfect money, hardest money, scarcest money, divisible, fungible, portable, durable, uh, it's all there. What are we waiting for? I'm, I'm sometimes thinking, you know, people need, but first they need to understand, well, you know, how can I benefit? You know, what's, what's in it for me? Uh, yeah. I, I, I agree with you on a few points. Um, the first thing is that people don't see this yet. Um, cause this is, takes many, many years or, or, or it takes many, many hours of, of study, I think, to understand the way that you and I do now. And I, I don't expect most people to do that. I think that's, that's silly of us to think that, um, you know, the vast majority of the world is going to spend all their time reading economics textbooks and, um, uh, delving into the, the specifics of how the technology works behind Bitcoin and understanding the, how the political, um, spectrum is, is tied into the economic spectrum in the system of money we have now um, and, and understanding, you know, cryptography and all, all these really complex topics. I don't think that's going to happen. And so the fact that we're educating people is great, but um, waiting for everybody to realize this would be silly because they won't. Most people are just happy scrolling on their Facebook feeds and, and playing the PlayStation 2s and there's nothing wrong with that. But what will bring people in? And I think that's what you're asking. And I think that's actually really simple. It's the same thing that brought me in. Yeah. Pure greed yeah. and the ability to store my wealth over a period yeah. of time. That's the saleability over time. That is really interesting because that is very apparent to everybody. All you have to do is look at the thing on the screen that goes up and up and up. And all Bitcoin has to do is A, survive, and B, keep going up. But why would it go up, right? Am I deluded? I think, oh, the price will just keep going up. No, it's it's super hard money. It is solving real problems for people in Venezuela and in Argentina and Iran and in Turkey. And if you look at the local Bitcoin charts on any of those countries, they're going like this because people are using them there, right? They, they, they're, they're, they are providing real utility to those people. There's a base demand for Bitcoin already. Yeah not just among the holders of last resort, among the Bitcoin community, among people who are so oppressed by such fiat shit coins that they can't even store their wealth day to day or week to week. They need this technology. Yeah. They will continue to use it as long as governments debase their currency. You know, Safety talks about the only way to kill Bitcoin is return to a gold standard. There's no way you'll ever convince governments to reliably return to a gold standard. No, it's too late for that. Anyway. Yeah. So, so the price will just keep going up as, 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 as the halvings come and provide more shocks to the supply. Uh, I believe the price will just keep going up and it will attract me more and more attention. And some people that come in on those next waves will, will spend the time and they'll, they'll listen to our content and hopefully realize that the system is so broken right now that, that this system really is better. Anybody that's willing to ask these questions honestly can find the information, it's, it's out there. We're creating it right now. And, and, and it's not just you and me, there's a plethora of knowledge that wasn't available, you know, even five years ago. So. Uh, yeah, I it's basic that's... supply and demand also, you know, I mean, that's what Rothbard, the Austrian economist said, you know, it's funny that in Keynesianism or this, you know, indoctrinated uh, economical system, uh, supply and demand applies in the microeconomics, but but lo and behold, it doesn't apply in the macroeconomics, not in money. That's weird, huh? So the more people, even if it's just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a Bitcoin, a few Satoshis holding in their hand, just holding it as a store of value, that alone, just that one person, that one human being can exponentially you know, trigger that, you know, that further increase, exponential increase of the whatever value, the purchasing power or the price of Bitcoin. Yeah, that's how I see it. So do you have any I, final thoughts, Ben? Um, I, I'm super, I'm super optimistic for the first time in a long time. Uh, ever since I was, you know, a, a teenager questioning everything, because I think as teenagers, we do do that. 
um, I have looked at this world and, and said that there seems to be so much strife despite all this technological progress. And it is only until now that I've realized that, uh, you know, I think the money is really at the root of the evil. Um, good money, I think, will fix uh, so many things. And the things that it doesn't fix, it'll allow us to fix. That I, I really finally have hope for the global civilization that we are today. And, and I have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's long people, short the nations, man. I mean, exactly. borderless. Yeah. Who cares, you know, who cares which, you know, which flag is flying? We care about our lives and, and the people that we love and, and the, the people that we want to transact with. I'm sorry, that, that's, that is most of our lives is us transacting with people. And I think being able to transact natively on the most important communication platform that, is, that has ever existed and that is still evolving exponentially. The internet today is still on the cusp of, of massive, massive uh, improvements in the way that we share ideas and the way that we now share value, that I, I really believe that civilization is finally headed in the right direction. You know, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Shout out another Marty Bennett. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, the, 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 the Pandora's box, you know, has been, has already been open for a long time, for 10 years at least, uh, you know, uh, and the cat is out of the bag, as I say. I mean, how are you going to put that decentralized architecture, the essence of this of Bitcoin, in, back into the bag again? You know, I see all these cats in the background of you. So <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, the cat is out of the bag. How are you going to put that back? You know, it, now we know how it works. You know, I mean, how are they going to ever, even if they, even theoretically, if they came together all, you know, with, I don't know, whatever nation states. And I mean, there are all, all these theories and maybe even realistic theories, you know, about, you know, this and that and counterattack and stuff like that. But seriously, isn't that too late? I mean, we could have a, a few billion people by the year 2024, 25, holding Bitcoin for the first time in their hands. What are they going to do with these people? Start World War Three? Or, you know, George Orwell, 1984, what's this going to look like? Yeah, there's just two quick thoughts I want to give on that. And I, I know you're trying to wrap up here, but... Um, Go ahead. You know, G Gigi said when you interviewed him that... Or actually, no, he... He, he, he said to me once um, that he thinks that it's, it's already, you know, it's already too late. You know, you're talking about this tipping point. And, and I actually agree with both of you. It's it's already too late. You know, this technology is out of the even if they killed Bitcoin, there's there's three thousand of the other ones. We can easily just copy the code and start a new one. You know, there's no way that you could put this back in the bag. Um, and I, I don't really think people have uh, come to terms with that yet. But I also agree with you that we have not yet reached the economic tipping point. And that's when, like you say, a significant percentage of the world actually holds this technology. And when that happens um, and it becomes normal to hold Bitcoin, well, that's when there's no more stigma, you know? Uh, and then people are like, oh, well, let's get more. And, and that's when I think you really see the, the final really big price rally. And, and, and anybody that isn't already on board, when, when Bitcoin goes to the moon, will automatically be on board. Yeah. Because again, the uh, the price. <laughs> yeah. That it's a really, really big attractor. Mass so, psychology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the 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 tipping point is already here, and the tipping point is coming. So, what you know, what a time to be alive. I keep thinking. Uh, I'll I'll leave you with one final thought. I keep thinking about this movie Fight Club. If you <laughs> haven't seen it, at the very end, you know, uh, Edward Norton's character just turns to Marla and he goes. You met me at a really weird time in my life. <laughs> How romantic. <laughs> Couldn't be more romantic than that. <laughs> no, no, brilliant movie know. because it questions really the whole fabric of our society and this whole artificial fabric. And I think for the first time, we, we, we create our own reality with this. You know, as you said, you know, divide and rule. We're going the opposite way. We go unify. You know, let's be one again and let's really focus on what is essential, you know, for our prosperity, joy and pleasure and, and you know, uh, our children, ourselves, our families. I mean, this is what it's about. It's about serving humanity at the end of the day. 
So yeah, beautiful set. Thank you so much for your time, Ben. And I hope to you know have a maybe a, a threesome talk uh, with Gigi or some other <laughs> Bitcoiner in the future. Absolutely, man. I would I would do this again in a heartbeat. Uh, abs thank you so much for reaching out. It was an honor being here. All righty. Thank you so much. That's all for this episode. Bye-bye. Later. Bye-bye, <laughs> Ben. Ciao.